Hey Grinder School, welcome back. This is Code Red Rules doing a live coaching video session today of Monty 3038. Uh, right now we are at Full Tilt Poker at 25 at no limit full ring. Uh, this has been a few months since we did our last uh, coaching video, so this one should be pretty fun, pretty interesting, and hopefully it goes by pretty good. Now I'm going to introduce you to right now Monty. Uh, go ahead, Monty, and say hello. Hi everybody, this is Monty. So, uh, we're just going to be going ahead and get started. Uh, Monty, I just want you to go ahead and play how you normally would play, and then I'll talk in the background and I'll ask you questions, and if you have any questions, you can ask me as well. Uh, right here, I would isolate it. I would have okay, raised this King-10 offsuit up to isolate. Um, yeah, we are dead blind. Uh, it's actually a good reason for us, even more of a good reason to, for us to bet. Um, Otherwise, we just go ahead and I would probably just fold it to the min bet. And well, now that we have the open and straight draw, I would probably call a bet here and uh, hope we hit the river on him. See what he normally plays. I mean, we we, uh, we have really good odds to draw. I mean, we're likely not going to be behind. I'd go ahead and call. Uh, we I wouldn't have called the flop, but I would definitely call it now that we had a d good draw that is going to be hard to see. Our opponent probably has a two. Yeah, I was looking at it. I was doing the math in my head. I was a little behind. I actually called the flop kind of just as we were getting started and not really thinking about it. Now, I want to ask you, uh, do you normally raise their preflop instead of just checking it because we're in position and we posted dead? Yeah, King-10 from uh, just before the button, I'll, I'll normally raise into that, uh, especially with dead money in there. Okay, because I was just wondering why you, why you didn't do it. And uh, make sure you have your auto reload set too, I believe. I forget where to do that. Okay, I have to turn that on. That's one great thing about a full tilt that you have the auto reload. This would be a fold uh, in this position from ace 10 for middle position. If it was suited, I could see myself opening it. Uh, well, now it's an easier fold, now that somebody opens. Ooh, no, 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 that's not a very good cold call at all. Uh, our opponent's got like 25 big blinds, and he opens it. We have no read on him. Uh, we, we're out of position here. We wouldn't be raising this, so we probably wouldn't, we shouldn't be calling this either. Uh, I'm having, uh, I'm, could you please explain your cold call there with the ace-10 off? Probably not in a way that makes it sound logical. Um, short stack, I'm going to at least play against him was my goal. Um, cold call was probably not the smartest move in the position I was in because see now we've got the guy in position kind of forcing me out of the hand. Um, so it really wasn't the best move probably. Now would you have played that normally if it would fold it around to you? Were you going to raise it? Yeah, I would have opened with that. Now, how how wide do you normally open that? Like, what position do you would you start opening that with? That's basically at my limit there for Ace Ten. Uh, I would have preferred it to be suited. Uh, basically, I'm not really that comfortable, honestly, with the flat call I made on it. Uh, it's okay. Uh, you probably he's got some uh, video jitters going on. Yeah, a little bit. Get me started and get me. Uh, Get me all going here. I'll, I'll loosen up a little bit and get more comfortable here as we go. And he's just doing his uh, auto rebuy. Yeah, auto top, I believe. I think it's the auto top button. Isn't the maximum 100 big blinds? Yeah, yeah. I love that setting on full tilt. Alright, so while we have some downtime here, I'd love it if you could explain the HUD stats and how you and how you use them. In between hands, you don't necessarily have to do it right now, but like when you have time, um, if something to talk talk about right now. Because you've got a lot of stats okay. up there. Well. Yeah, now's as good a time as any. 
Um, I didn't used to keep track of a lot on the HUD. Basically, I started off with a, a voluntarily put in pot, pre flop raise, and aggression factor, and that was it. After some discussions on Flop Turn River, uh, going back and forth with some guys, I added quite a bit to it. Um, I'm carrying a table image uh, off the auto rate. Uh, anytime I get over a certain number of hands, I think I have it set for 25 now because normally I'm playing 10 NL. I'm seeing an awful lot of players. So after about 25 hands, I give them kind of an image status based on some ranges. Um, there's not a lot of that going on. As you can see, like I'm rated as a rock, which is kind of appropriate. Um, after that, I've got voluntarily put dollars in the pot, pre-flop raise, uh, aggression factor, all pretty standard. After that, three bet percentage. Um, I, I don't know that I use that effectively, but I'm trying to learn to use that to know when I think somebody's going to three bet me to help put them on a range. Below that, I keep uh, continuing flop continuation bet percentage, then fold to flop C bet. Helps me see kind of whether they're getting in with good hands and continuing or kind of just jumping in the pot with nothing. At least that's my impression or what I'm trying to use it for. Uh, attempt to steal is after that, and then fold big blind to steal. I use those two for attempt to steal to know for the players that are coming and acting ahead of me whether they're coming into me with a steal or trying to get a feeler for if they are. And then the fold to steal I'll use for the two guys after me pretty frequently to know whether I think I can get away with a steal. Okay, that's a real good job explaining it. Thanks a lot. I mean, there's a lot of numbers up there that a lot of players will get confused by. You might have to go over them uh, later also if you have a detailed read about it. Ace Jack in this spot, I would probably just okay. ship it and out. Okay, I won't swear guy. that I use them all super effectively, but I give it a shot. I would ship in this guy pretty easily. He's got like, what's, well, less than 30 big blinds. blinds yeah, see, now this is a tough one for me because here I would normally call this, which I'm going to do just because he wanted me to play normal. And we're, we're going to miss it. But then again, with a bad flop like that, he's short. Yeah, we, we, well, the thing is we don't really have that much of a read on him. I'm definitely not folding this pre-flop. Uh, I wouldn't make a play on this flop right now, though. I would just fold it and let it go. Since he's chose short stack, though, you can actually make a play on it pre-flop and then just get it in because he's going to be folding it a lot. Given that he's less than 30 big blinds or so, you can just pretty much ship, shove, all, shove all in on him pre-flop and uh, it's going to be a plus EV play. And I have done that before. Uh, Ace-Jack is one of those hands that does give me a lot of trouble. Um, Ace-Queen seems to as well. Yeah, that's actually uh, fairly common. But the great thing about uh, just being able to shutting it all in there preflop is that you're just playing a preflop game. And uh, if you, you can actually just do the, use the EV equation on fold equity to know how, like, just determine how much he has to be open raising their preflop for that shove to be profitable. Uh, given your equity when he calls you, because granted, when you when you get called, you're probably going to be behind. Uh, I'm not actually denying that, but he should be opening such a wide range there that you can just like shove it on his face with also a pretty wide range. It's like just like playing a tournament. But I agree with you. I'm def the one thing I'm not doing is folding. And uh, let's see, I usually will do that, like if the guy's less than 30 blind. One of the topics that uh, you did ask me to prep some questions on also, one of them is uh, c-betting seems to be a problem for me and knowing when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. So uh, maybe we'll get some situations to look at that also. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons why I, I stressed a lot of the, the whole math thing in the past month or so is because a lot of it has to do with profitability of the continuation bet, like the same equation. Um, and I, I think I've said a year ago when I first started, started at grinder school that the you know, continuation betting is this whole art or whatever, and it, it really isn't as much as it is just uh, it's a math more, more and a science because it's all about range building. And you know once you put your point on a range, you can find out exactly how profitable a C-bet's going to work. I would fold this 9-10 offsuit preflop. 
Um, if I was going to play it, I'd isolate it up. And lately that's been my primary focus, is uh, trying to learn how to put people on ranges. And I would bet this out here, probably about 75 cents to a dollar. 80 cents is good. I don't like the overlimp here with the 10-9 offsuit, although you actually it's probably not that minus EV. Uh, in my opinion, you can be able to steal a lot when when checked to. I'm not too barreling this at all. Uh, I'll, I'll check this back, take our free cards. Um, he isn't, I don't think he's going to be folding after ch check calling like that. Uh, we've got good equity. We really don't want to get raised off our hand, but uh, it's a good two. I guess, uh, I guess worked out for him. Which, without a read, we really don't know what he's going to be doing that with. I probably would have just checked that back on the turn and uh, taken the free card. I'd. A lot of the times they're they're not gonna fold to you too much, but it worked out for you this time. That's one of those situations I get myself into where I uh, I I'm not 100% sure I'm ahead. I'm not quick at doing ranges, which makes it difficult. I know I've got at least a pair. I think I've got him beat that way, but I'm not 100% sure. And especially if that scare card, the king comes and he's hits his straight. I can't remember what the board was off the top of my head right now, but if he hits his straight, I'm in big trouble then, and I'll I'll end up getting stacked usually in that situation. Well, we have the straight. I mean, we hit the straight, but uh, I'd go ahead and re-raise these up against the short stack and get it in. That's that's okay. That's uh, what less than four X. Yeah, that's a good re-raise size. That'll work out just fine. Yeah, I I just don't know if you were actually at. I think he probably had some kind of weak jack, and uh, you were behind. But I actually would have put him also put him on like a little bit of queen, and I didn't expect him to fold quite often. But it worked out for you. And um, we are that's a horrible flop for us. I don't really see us not getting it in though. We Brady Bunch have to check it back and hope he shoves or bluffs us. Just the stack to pot ratio is like less than one in this instance. So I think he real I think he realizes this and we're just gonna get it in and you know, we get unlucky that he has that this is a good flop, but we give him an opportunity to bluff and uh well it looks like he was bluffing. Good play. I would have done the exact same. And okay, we are betting this out. I prefer bet or a check call. We could check call it here. Okay, he's. I don't like a check raise at all. It's a good call. I don't like open limping um, ever, really, in a no limit at any time. I'll talk to him about that after we finish. After we finish this 9 10 hand. I hope I'm not speaking too softly. I'm just trying to not yell. Uh, I don't know why he did. He, I think he bet the turn and this is even horrible. We're calling a raise after limping in. That's not that good. We're going to be put in a pretty tough spot. Again, we're in a pretty tough spot over here. We've got two over cards to our pair. We didn't hit anything. I liked your flop play on the 10-9 suited, and I would have just uh, probably checked the turn to him as well. I don't know what he's thinking of doing here. I would just go ahead and fold. I think he's trying to float the queen. Uh, I guess if he gets checked to here, he's got a bet. And if he's going to bet the turn, he's got to bet the river. But I don't know what he's thinking of doing. I'd blind steal that, make it, but I'd make it a dollar. Yeah, I'm not too sure I like that call there on, the, on this one here on the left. Well, you you try doing a float, but the only thing is you don't have a read on your opponent. You don't have any hands, so it's practically impossible to do any kind of post-flop maneuvering when you don't have any reads. It kind of turns into a mar like you know, a plus EV to rather spewy when you just start floating raises and c bets without a plan on future streets. And we all know I'm really good at planning. And I would probably just go ahead and call in this scenario. Uh, given this guy's really deep, we don't really have that good of a read on him. I believe he's tool. If he's 3123, it's a little bit better, but we have no idea what we're going to do to a 4 bet. Uh, there's a good chance that we're actually going to be ahead if he's going to be 4 betting us with an ace king and ace queen. 
I would just call here. We're not going to be flopping. Like I said, we're going to be flopping uh, over half the time. People, there's going to be an over pair flop to our hand. So we're going to put ourselves in a lot of tough scenarios by re-raising that hand. In fact, I probably don't even re-raise jacks there, and I probably only re-raise queens. Uh, the bet with th 325 is okay. It's a good bet size. Uh, the fact itself that you're betting doesn't really make um, too much sense other than the fact that uh, you're doing it as a complete bluff. So, uh, One thing I wanted to mention was the open limp that you did with the King-10 suited. Uh, I really don't like to open limp at all at any in any no limit game, really. And let's see, I would just cold call these jacks here okay. also. I have been guilty of doing that a fair amount, um, especially from early positions with marginal hands. Yeah, it's it's kind of like an addiction that a lot of players have. And this is not six max guys. This is the difference between six max and full ring. Um, six max, you have just the big blind, small blind button cut off, hijack, middle position. So, like, this guy is in a position earlier than 6 max even. So, and again, over roughly half the time we're in, a, in an overcard flop and we're going to put ourselves in a really crappy situation here and not know what to do. Um, he checks it back, which I think is fine. That wasn't the card I wanted to see. I would still check it back. I'd probably still check it back, because if we're going to put money in, we want him to be betting it. In, you have to uh, be mindful, Monty. This isn't uh, uh, six max. Uh, I probably would really slow down in re-raising your marginal pocket pairs like that, especially in full ring. Okay. But that guy calling the re-raise with ace queen is definitely noteworthy in itself because a lot of players won't even do that. So that's generally a note that I will take on a player if he calls re-raises with ace queen. Uh, then I will start value raising them. Uh, then I'll be re-raising his earlier position raises raises pretty lighter when and that is with like ace king and stuff because a lot of times I don't re-raise uh, ace king versus under the gun raisers because they just fold pretty much everything that they that we beat because that is a little bit of a conundrum when you have full ring play uh, you have uh, a lot of players ranges are, are actually fairly light. But the players, the, the the ranges that they call the uh, the re-raise with, is then really strong. So you have to put yourself in this ultimate. Um, you have to put yourself in this situation where you have to re-raise enough that you're going to get paid off with their wide with their you know, with their garbage. I don't have a lot of time in on uh, ten cent, twenty five cent, or twenty five nl as I guess we're calling it. Um, so I don't have a lot of notes on a lot of the players up here now. In 10 NL, I do tend to take quite a few notes and have uh, quite a wide range of that. That is one of the things I think I do fairly well is I do take a lot of notes on players. Uh, that's, uh, that's that's really good. Uh, I, I really like taking notes. A lot of players don't take notes, and I think it really hurts their uh, their win rate. A lot, of, a lot of players get lazy, and they just stop doing it, and... Whenever I go and say I coach somebody and I see that they just stop taking notes and uh, it gets really frustrating because uh, I take notes even on players in tournaments because you have no idea when you're going to see the player person again. I get some random notes going from you know maybe even like six months ago from a random play that I saw a guy make that was absolutely horrid and you know just writing it down is just perfect. Again with the open limping, uh, not open limping ever. I mean. You could argue that. I do that tend to prefer the note taking ability in full tilt to poker stars, though, because you can't add the little color codes. And I know that, especially in tournament play, when I was playing mostly sit and goes, I'd make them color coded for how strong I thought they were, so I knew what, what to do against them, basically. Uh, and if we're going to be checked to there, we got to be betting it. And not really, taking, not really protecting the pot, but just pretty much taking the pot down. He gives it. He gave us two free, you know, two free instances. We can get maybe get a value bet out of yeah, a little bit. He's going to bet this over here on the right. I think I'm going to have to dump out of it. Oh, he checked it. And we let him get there with the seven of spades. Uh, I again don't like the open limp with uh, pretty much anything. 
Um, although it's not horrible with the pocket pair there, but in general, I tend to never open limp. The ace ten, we're in a same similar situation with the ace jack. I'm not sure where I picked it up at, but uh, with the pocket pairs early, I guess I'm limping, um, especially the small ones below nine nine, you know, eight eight and below. Uh, trying to uh, hit my set or, or hit something decent on the flop, uh, so that I have some bases to continue because I assume I'm behind on most of those hands. See, that's the thing. You actually have a pair. You're probably most likely ahead. Uh, that's interesting you say that. I'm actually, uh, a buddy of mine and I, we did some research over a period of our own hand histories, and I guess it's basically an all in how you play the hands, but in early position, like, our, our hands are much more profitable when we just actually open them and then uh, put a seabed out there rather than just limping and uh, hoping or playing for set value that way. And I don't know if he noticed that the guy limped under the gun. But even so, I don't mind the raise there with the seven. That's not a bad raise, even though you're out of position. I, I probably would have just. One of the things that I've been working on being reading uh, people's ranges and that I tend to focus because I don't necessarily have as good a skills at picking up on their playing style. So I tend to focus a lot on their stats. So how reliable do you think basing your ranges loosely on their stats is? That's actually a really useful tool on identifying ranges. Um, I usually do that a lot. It's a, really the only opportunity you, you have to do it when you're playing a lot of tables. Uh, you, you start with their stats and then you go from there. A, a guy who's a re really bad, who's seeing you know, maybe 50% of the flops, it's extremely difficult to put him on any kind of range. Again, the three betting with the eights? I don't get this at all. I'll have him explain it to us this time. He's like in the same position again. Let me see. I think he's even one. Well, it's pretty close. See, we're putting ourselves in a really tough situation. Well, he's uh, opening pretty wide up here. But he's got to narrow him down a little bit because he's ahead of me. Uh, this is one of those situations where I'm not 100% sure where I should go on this one. And that's why we really don't like to re raise hands like pocket eights in this, in this spot. I was going to ask you to pretty much uh, explain explain your re-raise and, uh, and what was the reasoning behind that. Well, I'll be honest with you, I may, may not have had a really good reason for it. Um, I've been trying to work on my position play, playing a wider range of hands from more positions. Um, I've been trying to get away like you said, a little bit from limping, a little bit from calling behind, and it seems like in 10 NL, a play like that uh, pretty much takes it away from the players because they're pretty wide open. A lot of them have just humongous ranges. See, the thing you want to think about with a hand like that is it has a lot of value post-flop. You know, it can, it can win a, a nice size pot uh, post-flop. So you don't really need to turn it into a bluff like you did there pre-flop. The difficult thing that's going to happen is that, like like you said, he could be four betting there with a pretty wide range of ace king or, or you know ace queen, maybe even ace jack, because he sees that you're re-raising him lighter, and you could be folding the best hand, but you you really don't know, and you put in a lot of money. I I you can just usually set mine there, okay, and then um, once you hit your hand, they'll pay you off. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because I did play them that way a lot in the past, and I'm not sure where I picked up this habit of doing it this way. The thing is, like, calling there with eights is probably the super standard play. I don't know if there is a single poor person that I would actually want to re-raise there with the eights, unless that guy was short-stacked and he only had $3 left in his stack, then I would see myself re-raising him there and isolating him to getting it in. Yeah, it makes more sense than the way I've been playing them. Because uh, the whole thing about re-raising is you want you want it to be for two reasons. Like you either want it to be as a bluff or for value. So were you re-raising the eights there as a bluff or were you doing it for value? 
in kind of a strange way, I guess I'm doing it for value. I'm figuring that uh, I do have a fair portion of his range, either that I'm ahead or that I'm competitive with, and I'm trying to get money in the pot. And I guess I'm kind of looking at it a little incorrectly there. Well, that's the thing. Like, I do believe that you're probably ahead, but... Like, you're probably not ahead to his re-raising, his calling the re-raise range, which is what's very interesting about um, full ring and even like null and even six max, is that when you re-raise a hand, you, you don't really determine about the, the range that he has right now. You think about what his range is going to be calling your re-raise with. So, like, the hand that he's calling the re-raise with, probably, uh, you don't, re you're not that big of a favorite over. Uh, you're pro at best, you know, maybe 55% over his, you know, Broadway cards, and he's going to have a lot of um, nines and tens and jacks a lot, too, that he's not going to be four-betting you with. So when you make a re-raise like that, you got to think about, oh, you know, before you make the re-raise, what's going to be calling that re-raise um, and what you're doing it for. It's not a bad call or a bad re-raise in this spot against this player. Makes sense. And so that's why I wanted. That's why I asked you if it was for a bluff or was it for value. Um, I don't think you'd really want to be. Bl I don't think you'd really be bluffing the guy. So, I I kind of I kind of figure it's for value. I would just call this in this spot. That's a good call. And I'll probably depending on how much he bets. This actually wouldn't be a bad spot to raise or fold. Yeah, I can just feel the burning question coming about that hand. Was it the Queen Ten suited? Yeah. Uh, you know what? I don't think he played it that horrible. Uh, the cold call preflop was fine. You could have re-raised there. That would have been a good spot. That's a good hand to uh, uh, defend the button with. You could have also raised the turn, or you could have raised uh, the flop. Although I don't really care for raising the flop too much. I like your call on the flop, but once he bets that turn again. He's most likely doing it just to fold to a raise. Um, I, I don't. I like the fact that you didn't call, so I think the turn is like a raise or fold there against him. Okay, maybe you can clarify for me. You mentioned that he's betting that to fold to a raise. Can you maybe explain that a little better for me? Sure, certainly. There's probably a five percent chance. I don't know. I'm just making this number off the top of my head that he hit that six or that he has a boat. And so the only really the only real hand that he's gonna call the raise with maybe pocket aces and pocket kings. And so when he makes his when he makes that bet there, he's doing it with uh, with he's not really thinking about what he's what's what he's gonna do if somebody raises him. And the fact of the matter is there you're gonna raise him when you have the nuts. Nuts so often that he's gonna actually gonna fold the majority of his range too. So you, like you know the six pairs, and so it's a real good chance that he didn't hit the six. You can represent the six, and he's really got to give you respect on that, and you've got a good redraw out too. That's a good call with the eights. I play the, I play the same. Well, and like you said in the last video, anytime you're doing a video, you got to get lucky once in a while. Yeah, he only had like 15 big blinds. There's really nothing you can do to get away from that. Well, I know, uh, I forget who the player was the focus of in the last video, but he ran really, really good during your video. Oh, Andy. His name is Andy, uh, Pirate13. He's actually still a student of mine. And he's just moved up to 50, no limit, full ring. Um, this, this month, so it's been pretty interesting going with him. Might have to make a follow-up video uh, eventually. I'm sure he won't be against it, but um, it might be the one-year anniversary thing if he's still hanging around, or maybe he's gone past that. But uh, yeah, he's he's getting a pretty, he's becoming a pretty good player. Well, that was one of the things that uh, was a big topic of discussion back on uh, Flop Turn River a while back was what are your goals? So uh, basically that's a 
good indication I'm looking to move up to play 25 NL exclusively and then start dabbling in 50 NL hopefully before the end of the year. Yeah, I have no doubt that you know if you really tried and you really put in your uh, re you put in your research and your reads and stuff that uh, you will uh, get that way. That's a really, really large, extremely large overshove. Fifty big blind or forty big blinds. Trying to think. I would definitely be opening this. I think his king two suited there open was just fine. I I'd open this, and if Gambler comes in, I'd either call or I'd re-raise again. This guy is pretty aggro. I think he's 2218 is what these re stats read. A uh, really good spot to re-raise as a bluff. Uh, actually, it really depends on how often he folds to three bet. Um, this is a number that I don't believe Poker Tracker has yet. He's using PT3. Wow, that's a really. I don't understand why he's making such a large rage or large raise here on the button. Uh, could you under, could you uh, explain your bet sizing there? I assume you mean the table here on the right. Yeah, on table two. The hand previous, uh, I raised from the small blind as basically a steal, and she repot me all in uh, with no history on her at all. Um, I kind of varied the bet sizing a little bit, even though I do tend to be. Uh, here, hang on, just a second. This is a spot where I would definitely call on this player. Definitely call. This guy's a twelve-seven rock. Uh, he's opening probably. I do tend to be a, a, a four times big blind no matter what, um, and then add a big blind in for any limpers. Uh, but that time I kind of varied it up a little bit, I guess more to see her commitment level, and I don't know if that really makes a lot of sense, but if she's going to come in and repop me again after repopping me her first hand in that I had seen, uh, I wanted to make her a little higher because I felt that the Jack Queen had obviously more value than what I was trying to steal with before. See, our goal there with the Ace King is to not have our opponent fold. Like we want him to stick in the pot with Ace Queen. If he if he has Ace Queen there and he folded, it, it's actually a really big mistake because we're 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 extremely large favorite, and he's going to give us two maybe three suits of value post flop. When we hit top pair, top kicker, or as compared to we just get his blinds when he raise folds our preflop. Yeah, I really don't agree with you reasoning there with the bet sizing. I would just stick to the same bet sizing as he did in the last hand. The fact that sh that uh, Dragon Lady reshoved you all in had absolutely nothing to do with how much you raised preflop. And so, like, the fact that you you know doing it again the next hand. Just the fact that you raised it an extra big blind isn't actually going to change anything. True, and, and you know, it's kind of funny because you don't realize some of your reasoning, I guess, till you try to uh, verbalize it and, and, and explain it to somebody. And you know, I, even hearing it myself, it didn't seem to make as much sense as I thought it did when I did it. You know what, and that's actually a really useful tool to help yourself out. Uh, one interesting thing about making videos a lot is the fact that I get I have to explain myself at almost every turn. And so there's some times where, you know, maybe I'm having a bad session or a bad day, and I'll either, one, record myself play with, with and just, you know, talking through every single play that I make, or just talking through every single play that I make without makes making a video, and, you know, that way you at least have to explain yourself why you're doing something. You know, it's like, I re-raise this guy here because it's for value. He's going to call me with the worst hand, and then we're going to get paid post-flop. You know, you're going to have you go through these things in your head, and so therefore, uh, later down the line, you don't have to do that. But every once in a while, it is a good thing to do. Well, I can see that working for me a lot better than just trying to replay him through the hand replayer and poker tracker because a lot of times it takes me a heck of a lot of time to go back and try and figure out if I had any reads on the player and whereas if I was just speaking it out loud I could say it while I was doing it that's actually a pretty good idea
Yeah, and I'm and I'm sure there are players on uh, Grinder School that would you know would benefit and would love to actually just to watch a video from you know from you. There's uh, one of the threads there that you can they have a, a server that you can upload your video to. I either raise this preflop or I would call. I'm definitely not holding. And then you can get feedback back from them, and um, you know go from there. Hey, I don't mind a raise. Uh, probably would make it. Probably make it about a dollar and a quarter. I'm definitely not folding. I'm not folding. Like, I'd probably folding would probably like the last thing that I would do in that instance. You're, you're getting really good odds to play. I probably my first instinct would be to raise preflop, uh, pretty much for value. Um, and secondly, I can uh, I'd, I'd limp in if I think my opponents don't fold the continuation bets. I actually wanted to talk to you more about that ace king hand, and I was wanting you to explain your reasoning why you three bet that uh, opponent to your right. Uh, let me see if I can remember that here. I think it was this uh, this one that I he bet in first. It's a good raise with the ace jack, and I would just fold the ace. I guess my reasoning for it. Um, and oh, let me give you a quick reason for this here. I, I've seen and I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble playing uh, aces, um, you know, ace X, ace junk, all over the place over the last few months. So I've kind of really gotten away from playing aces uh, I pretty would much all over the place. To shove this all in. Uh, okay. Back to the ace king hand. Um, I guess my thought was as I was trying to get it in, uh, trying to get as much as I could in uh, pre flop. Figuring I'm ahead at that point and had a good chance. Uh, I, that's the thing. If you were called in that spot, you were in pretty big trouble. Like your opponent's stats are like 12-7, uh, I believe, right? Uh, if you look back at the hand, it was Meyer Meyer Zhang opened from early position. Now I wanted like the the first step that you can make in determining a range is what is your what are you doing in that spot like so what hands are you opening with under the gun plus two yeah I can see what you're saying and, and my range in there is ace king you know jacks and up usually um, you know, I'm limping a lot of pairs that are smaller than that which is not exactly the best move myself so it puts him on a pretty tight range that I'm not really fully ahead of so I really probably shouldn't be trying to get it all in there Right, and the other thing you have to ask yourself is, well, let's say that he does open ace queen. If he open, if he raises ace queen but folds to a re to a re raise, do you want him to? Uh, do you want him to, to? Do you do you want to re raise that opponent when you have ace king? Well, no, you don't, and and that's the problem. That's I think the level of play I'm still at. I'm still trying to get out of that level one mindset. You know, oh, I've got ace king. I need to get the money in, and I need to get it ahead. Uh, whereas now I'm starting to think about what they do have, and how I'm doing in comparison to them. But I'm still kind of trapped in that that card mindset. I've got a good hand. I got to play it. Yeah, the, like that's a, so that's something else to think about. It looks like you have a, a pretty a problem playing three bet pots, and a lot of it is depending on you know what you think your opponent has, and what then what you should do with your own hand compared to what your opponent has. That would be a a, a fairly standard instance of just going ahead and, and cold calling the ace king there. I probably just I probably just flat out fold ace queen to him. I don't think he's folding a hand worse than I don't think he's raising a hand worse than ace queen there, because if, if if he was, then I would be taking a note on it. Um, and to think about it yourself, you know, you said yourself, like if you're if you're only raising tens or better an ace king, uh, do you think your opponent's raising less than that or or more than that compared to his stats? Oh, he's going to be way tighter than that, I would think, um, so based on his stats. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's definitely a mistake to be folding it there, and I can see it, you know, when we talk about it slower. That's one of the things that uh, has been difficult to me is to translate some of the studying and that into quicker play that I can actually do at the table. Yeah, probably the, the best thing to do when you're determining range is, like I said, start with what you're doing there and 
determine if he's raising it more or less. And then we think about like in the correct play, like well, what is, it's pretty much if you think through it, it should work out just fine. Like well, if he's only raising that much there, then I probably don't want to create a big pot with Ace King just yet. The great thing is like you can call there and you pretty much will have odds to hit your ace or king when he has his lower pair because the chan he's still going to see bet on the ace, ace or king flop a lot and he's going to do it incorrectly or and or he's going to be calling the bet if if he checks to he's he's going to check call bet with middle pair just because he doesn't want to give up on it so you're going to be getting good implied odds just to spike top pair and I was telling everybody else that like you don't want him to fold. Like, if he ever has ace queen there and he folds it, it's pretty. It's a it's a crime because he's gonna pay you off at least two streets post flop when you hit your top air top kicker on that flop. Yep, makes sense, and uh, I can absolutely see what you're saying. So that's probably one big difference between six max and full ring right there. Yeah, and maybe not even in six max you want to re-raise the ace king. It, it, it's entirely opponent dependent who I re-raise there. It's it's not really situational as as it is opponent. Uh, the same uh, opponent could be is raising a lot more under the uh oh, sorry on the button than he is under the gun. I'm gonna re-raise him with the ace king. The someone who just re-raise or just raises a lot period. And he's going to call the re-raise. Like this guy up here, Arvist, and called the re-raise with ace-queen. Here's another good example of a hand that I struggle with is suited connectors. I know people tell me to play them like small pairs. Um, I do just definitely struggle with them, though. Yeah, playing in small pairs would be like you can raise this preflop and then treat it like you do pocket fives when you miss it after you raise. And play it like if you hit middle pair, then you play it like you would hit like you know middle pair when you have your pocket pair. Yeah, that's actually a really bad board, I believe. I mean, King Jack's gonna call you any queen, uh, the two hearts, any pair between nines and aces is gonna call you, and now eights. I'm not really liking any play. You can maybe get a little bit of value out of a bet. We might be ahead also. But you, it, it is just a good thing to just raise the suited connector sometimes for, you know, major um, range merging. And if you're on a tight table, you know, it's it's uh, not a bad problem. I think GRP has a smaller pair than eights. We're probably ahead. Yeah. You know, you you pretty much played that pretty well. I mean, I don't see about that board either. And you played it like you would have played pocket sixes on that board. You know, you check it back and you know hope you're ahead of showdown. That's probably the first suited connector hand I've won in two weeks. Well, and you notice that you won it because you raised preflop and you didn't limp. And the thing is, now you're actually going to have some kind of image on the table. They're going to be wondering, um, you know, what you're, what you're opening with. They, when they see you opening the suit connector, they're going to put you uh, as a pretty aggressive player. So they're going to give you less credit um, for in the future. And it costs you like what three or four big blinds. And I mean, you end up winning in the hand. The 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 fact that a lot of players get afraid that they're going to get stacked with a hand like that when they play it. And the thing is, you can only lose your stack if you decide to lose it yourself. You're not going to be losing a big pot with, with just a pair. You're not going to be stacking off with anything less than two pair, maybe even a straight or, or a flush, you know. So it's, it's really just something to be, you don't have to worry about too much when you lose your stack. If anything, you're just going to lose like ten big blinds combined between the, the raise preflop and the continuation bet. Well, I will admit that uh, at my level, where I'm at now, uh, when I do hit anything, I do have a hard time letting go. Um, so I have gotten stacked quite a few times with similar hands. Well, then you probably should just, uh, if you if you do have a problem playing middle pair uh, out of position, 
which it isn't the easiest thing to do, then it isn't it isn't bad to just go ahead and fold them. I mean, you don't have to play them. Uh, some players have success playing them. Some players just don't. And you know, there's nothing wrong with you not 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 having the the skill set just yet to be able to play those profitably. Now, it's something that you should work on. Uh, like if you sell yourself, I'm not very good at playing this, and then you just never fix that leak, then it's just always something hanging over your head. I, pro I probably would have blind stolen there. Right, and I think that's where I've kind of gotten into trouble. Is I that's what led to me tending, I think, also to limp them in early positions. You know, small pairs, twos, fives, sixes. The reason why I don't care for limping the uh, small pairs is mainly because you're not ever really limping in your pocket aces. And so, like, whenever somebody sees you limp, they can always they can raise you preflop and just isolate you, and there really isn't much you can do about it because you're going to be in no man's land post flop the majority of the time. And if you ever do play back at somebody post flop, it's like you have a set almost always. So it's and it's really hard to to merge that range. You're limping under the under range when you have uh, medium strength hands and be able to play them profitably out of position. So that's why I like to just go ahead and raise everything that I'm going to play and never open limp. Um, because the fact of the matter is you should probably never be open limping your ace's hand. And so you probably would only be open limping your marginal hands. So therefore you raise your marginal hands to protect your big hands also. Uh, I can see that and it absolutely makes sense. So like, you know, further explanation, like say you only raise two hands under the gun. You raise pocket twos and pocket aces. Your opponent who has pocket kings has no idea what hand that you have, right? But the only fact that matters is if he re-raises you, you're only going to continue with pocket aces. Um, Post-flop, you're only going to continue when, uh, with a set of twos or your overpair aces. And so when you have a, a really even range like that, your opponents have absolutely no idea how to, t to, to play against you. Now rather, before, if your opponent had eight, uh, had pocket kings, well maybe pocket kings isn't, isn't, isn't that great of an example, but let's just say that like, before, if you're open limping your weak hands, then your then your opponent is, is sure that uh, he's going to be ahead when he has his kings in his hand, or maybe even his queens or his jacks or even or even his tens. If you never even open limp tens, I'd over limp this behind quite often. Uh, if we have a suited ace, we're going to go, go for uh, the flush over flush. I don't, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. He's trying to think about what he wants to do with it. Um, I mean, folding it isn't isn't horrible, but then again, I'd rather just call, and I don't mind calling or re-raising here. Uh, I don't really like his re-raise size, but as again, around I think 40% of the time we're gonna flop an overpair. I probably would have just bumped it up to like 350 and then bet any flop. And we got a call, that's fine, and check. And I mean, it's really hard to do this without a, without a read on our opponent. I mean, he's either gonna have the kings or he's not. He doesn't have the king, so it's really up in the air what to do. I'm, and meanwhile, I'd probably open up this jack ten suited over here while I was thinking about the jacks. Kind of a little multi-table trick. I'd probably just go ahead and fold it. Yeah, ace king. Uh, could you go over your re-raise size preflop? Okay, um, I was looking at his stats, which weren't very good. Uh, apparently I didn't have very many hands on him, no, it was only four. I used to keep the number of hands on my HUD also, and I'm thinking I'm going to have to put that back on there so I have that info available. But um, he, from the stats I had, I think it said he was in 67% of his hands. He had voluntarily put in and raised none of them. Um, he made a small raise there to open from, let's see, He'd have been the button over one, so he'd have been. Uh, it's still an early position, and I was a uh, uh, big blind. 
I, I kind of min raised him. I wanted him to get more money in. I uh, figured with Jax, I'm ahead. I didn't want to pop it big because I figured he's going to drop it and fold. So I, I just min raised him to keep him in there. Um, I ch checked it on the flop, uh, hoping he would bet something worse than Jax and let him take the initiative and kind of follow him through. I think your your reasoning is okay. I, I just don't know if you're applying it all too correctly yet. Uh, your re-raise size preflop there should be relatively correlated to what you want to do on the flop. And I say that because you know he's he was a short stack so he's got like 30 big blinds or around there. And now we just go ahead and fold to this guy because he's so tight. Although now that we're ahead, I would check the pair because he most likely has ace king and he's not going to be calling a bet. Um, and he's only going to hit his pair one in some of Now if he calls the bet, it's going to be he's going to have nines and eight all too often. Although it's not it's not bad to bet there. So and what I was saying is the the re raise size preflop is what you want to do with on the flop. And since he's only got like 30 big blinds uh, and he made it too, you want to make it amounts that you can pretty much just shove all in any flop. And a, a tournament players would call this like a go and go scenario. Uh, I don't think really just making it a dollar there preflop does too much. I mean, yeah, he's not going to be folding, so you're right, he's keeping, keeping his entire range in there. But it's going to be so hard for you to play out of position with the stack sizes that way. If you made it, if, if instead of making it a dollar, if you instead made it, you know, three dollars, and the pot is six dollars, and the flop, uh, and the and he only has four dollars behind, uh, that makes it so much easier to play post flop because it's just one bet poker. Now, when you made it one dollar, and the pot becomes two dollar, and he's got six dollars behind, uh, that now becomes like two straight poker and an over pair is going to hit like over 40% of the time. Over pair has been over card is going to hit. Right, and I can definitely see that in my play. That's something I haven't uh, worked too much on and something I do see as a problem. I need to work on what am I going to do on the next street or what's my plan for the whole hand. And the and to, to tell you the truth, I think a lot of players have that same problem. It, it's just not you, and it's just not like uh, it, it's a, it's a symptom that I see a lot, and it's not necessarily the easiest way to fix it. Although just just playing, slowing down, and playing like a few number of tables here, and just thinking about what you're going to do in the hand uh, really helps out. Like especially come from experience, it's like well, if this guy does this here, I don't know what I'm going to do. I would probably just fold. This guy's really tight. 2-2. Two, two. His 50 hands is a pretty easy fold. Although you could probably re-raise that guy any two cards. Yeah, he's, he's got such a small range for that. There's just no way I can continue with him. Again, with the king-queen there, I would have just folded the king-queen preflop. Uh, we're way out of position here. We want to be brazing that up in the hijack. I agree with you on that. If you actually are getting two to one, I would still make the call, uh, just for pot odds reasons. But yeah, he's other than otherwise he's just so tight that uh, you gotta fold that. But so it looks like right now you're you're playing uh, pretty good, but it looks like your leak. Has a lot to do with three betting and when to three bet, why to three bet, and and all that. Uh, actually, I think your post flop is uh, fairly okay. I mean, you seem to understand uh, when to let your opponent take away the initiative and when you want to keep it for yourself. That's that's always that's a good sign. I probably would have actually folded the jacks on the turn when the king, uh, when the ace hit. Um, or I'm sorry, not when the ace hit, but uh, without a read there, it's really hard to make a to make a play when he's going to be bluffing you on, on two threes after calling preflop. 
But then again, I probably wouldn't have put myself in that scenario because I would have re-raised more pre-flop and then pretty much just like made your decision for you on the flop. Yep, sounds good. Makes more sense than the way I played it. Alright, so after this uh, small blind passes you on hand, on table number two, we're going to go ahead and have you uncheck, and uh, we can wrap up the video, but uh, we're going to wait and, you know, we'll wait till you sit out at the big blind stage on each table, so we'll have some more hands, and if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them right now. The hour goes by pretty quick. I guess, uh yeah, I guess really the only other question that I had um, is um, there's a, I know it'll come with time, and, and I guess there's a question of is there any way to kind of accelerate your learning um, as far as your uh, odds charts other than just rote memorization, um, kind of putting a percentage to a range, you know, like 8% uh, should be roughly these hands, you know, things like that, is other than just straight out rote memorization, which doesn't work well for me, is there anything you've kind of found that helps you learn that? Well, I, I guess I can, there's a couple answers to your questions, like one, know what your range is in a certain spot, and know what your hands are going to be, and then that might help you remember more what like another percent range is going to be. Uh, and in general, in terms of just like memorizing a hand chart, that's actually what I rec recommend doing is just memorizing a hand chart and just getting it down concretely and then knowing why in certain spots that you do some things as compared to others. You go from there. I find it's a lot easier to work backwards than it is to work forwards. Like uh, in in some in most instances, uh, especially regarding just like hand hands and whatnot, I would just go ahead and fold this. We only have six hands on their opponent, so we really have no option to make a read. Ace eight's pretty garbage. Yeah, I'd probably even fold ace queen here, although ace queen would be much closer than ace eight. I don't know what he's doing calling. Uh, we're gonna put ourselves in a really crappy spot. We're gonna flop top pair no kicker. We're not going to get any value from an ace when we do hit it and if he doesn't have it. Um, so now that we hit the ace, we can't really fold it. So uh, now that you've gotten this far, you can't fold your ace, but it's a pretty bad call preflop. Yeah, but you didn't want to end with a perfect hand, did you? I, I really, I might even fold a hand like ace-queen there, although ace-queen I probably would, if I was going to play it, I would just shove it in pre-flop. Like, uh, calling a raise in position with a hand like ace-eight is, is pretty bad. Uh, you're really hoping to hit an ace, and even, even when you hit your ace, you really didn't like your hand all too much. Point well taken. That is one thing I took away from the last video, too, is the ace-6, and I never really thought about that. My basis for the card that was with the ace was, well, it beats half the deck, you know, so the eight's a better hand, uh, card than a seven, but you can't make a straight with, you know, ace-8, eight, ace-7, eight, ace-6. If you think you were ahead, and you think your opponent's that bad, which I, you really can't get that because your opponent's only played six hands... So effectively, anything less than ten is really hard to really have any kind of concrete read. But if you thought you were ahead, you should have just got it in pre-flop, uh, and not waited to get it in on the on the flop or hit your hand. Because a lot of t you know two two out of three times you're gonna miss your top pair, even more so when you hit an eight and it's gonna be like third pair. And so he's actually gonna be able to just re-raise you pre-flop when you call, and then shove that any shove any flop when he hits and it's going to be profitable for him much more so than it would be for you to call with the ace and hope to hit your ace. Good point. And I, I guess to continue on your question, another thing that you could do the, that I found that, r that kind of puts learning in overdrive is to continue with like find a coach and get, get some coaching lessons. Uh, it, it does get it does get expensive, but it, it's a little more one on one, and it really helps concrete down some reads and thought thought process and whatnot. 
like, I can tell you from personal experience that like uh, I, I I've hired a coach. I think Spend has hired a coach. I don't remember if uh, JGB has or not, but like it's very common for even mid to high stakes uh, poker players to sit there and hire a coach and help help them out through certain scenarios. And this is pretty much a good example of like what a coaching session would be for me. Like you just go over, uh, I watch uh, from 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 my from my coaching sessions. I watch them play and I comment on them, and then you know try and figure out your thought process and then go from there. Well, I can see it being real, really beneficial because watching your last video, I got quite a bit out of that. So it may not have shown in my play in this video, but uh, I do think I got more out of that than just watching somebody sit and play and uh, maybe just comment on their own hands. It's kind of the back and forth banter that helps me to pick it up and memorize it. I mean, I actually I had a coach when I first started playing full ring. Uh, I it was more of a, a friend. Really uh, taught me how to the, the basic ins and outs and how to to not play how how it's different from six max, which is pretty much uh, which is what is what which was necessary for me in the beginning. But like it didn't take long once I hired the coach to get me um, on the right track. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and end the video right now. But uh, if you want to go ahead and and say goodbye, you can. All right, well, hey, I wanted to thank you for your time. I want to thank Grinder School for giving me the opportunity. And, uh, hey, everybody, let's work together and let's get better out there. Yeah, thanks a lot, Monty. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Monty. Thanks, Grinder School. Uh, otherwise, this has been an, another coaching session, and this has been Cobra Rules coming to you from uh, Full Tilt Poker 25 No Limit coaching video. Hopefully you guys have been made this beneficial, and I'll uh, you know make put some comments in the threads. And otherwise, uh, good luck at the tables.